So in the last few videos we've talked a lot about the land biomes and in this video I want to talk about the water biomes. There's a lot more water in the planet than there is land. In fact you can see that in this infographic here that a majority of the world has aquatic ecosystems. That the land is in fact the minority of the ecosystems on earth. The majority of the ecosystems are marine ecosystems and then you kind of have a little bit of freshwater ecosystems, a lot of desert, less forests, and a little bit of almost the same in grasslands and very very little rainforests and things like coral reefs and yet in this very little part of the earth the majority of the diversity is going to be in the coral reefs and in the rainforest but still water biomes are a big piece of the earth and so it's very important to talk about them now there's of course uh, three main kinds of these water biomes you're gonna have fresh water salt water and then estuaries which is kind of in between where in the salt water is hitting the fresh water and it kind of like you have this brackish kind of water. So I'm going to start talking about the fresh water environments and there's going to be two types. There's going to be the flowing fresh water and the standing fresh water. Of course this picture is representing the flowing fresh water and there's two main kinds. You're going to have rivers or streams. The biggest difference is that the streams will have a lot more uh, rock than land on around it rock than water so very few organisms that are large are going to live in those kinds of environments. But rivers are very diverse environments and have a lot of different kinds of awesome aquatic uh, organisms. Um, either of them are very important for life on Earth, though. And in fact, most of the animals of the land that we talked about before are maintained by fresh water from these ecosystems. So, and it's very, very, very little of the water on Earth. In fact, is like this. Fresh water is a great minority, and the majority of the fresh water is actually trapped in ice caps and glaciers. So river systems are, are very, very important, but a rare ecosystem of the Earth. One thing that I want to talk about that, though, is that one peculiar thing of river ecosystems is that they're going to be all about whatever they're going through. The dirt, the kind of soil that they're going through, is going to determine what kind of life lives there because it's going to determine what kind of nutrients are there. Now, the faster the river, river is flowing, the harder it's going to be for things to live attached to the bottom of the river, so there, there are going to be more less things like um, river grass and things like that. And the slower the river moves, the more of that you're going to have. And you also see in these kinds of ecosystems that the flowing of the water helps maintain the amount of gases that exist in the river. So there's usually very little problems with that unless the river has is too much full of nutrients or toxins or things like that. There usually is plenty of oxygen to go around in the river's ecosystems. And it's an advantage of flowing water because the water is constantly flowing around and it causes the gases to mix in with the air a little bit more. So that's a, a peculiar thing of river ecosystems. Then you have standing water ecosystems which include large bodies of water such as lakes. Some of them are even called seas, you know, uh, and some of them even become salty over long periods of time because uh, erosion and runoff eventually bring salt to them. So some of the largest lakes on the world are actually salt lakes, even though they're not part of the oceans. You might think about how, why the oceans are salty. In aerospace science we learned that as the water cycle goes by, the water constantly drops more salt into these bodies of water but uh, then it evaporates to restart the cycle but it leaves the salt behind so over long periods of time the gas actually get more and more salty now the majority of large bodies of water disappear before they get a chance to get that salty you know uh, lakes are very unstable ecosystem uh, environments change over millions of years and it gets drier or or wetter or whatnot and so that will change the size of the lakes and that that's why very rarely large lakes actually become salty. But there are plenty of examples around the earth, including the Dead Sea, the Salt Lake Sea here in the U.S., plenty of examples of saltier seas. And the, the older the lakes are uh, at a, without growing, they will become saltier and saltier. But lakes typically either grow or shrink throughout their lives. And so, but either way, you see here that there's a lot of different kinds of these ecosystems. You have lakes. You also have bogs. And bogs are like, you know, basically... Uh, covered with uh, vegetation usually, so it, it looks. If you if you're not careful, you won't even realize that the the lake, the water, the standing water is there. Right in the middle, the bottom here, you see an example of a bog, right, right there, and you also have an example of marshes and swamps, and they're a little less covered with vegetation in the case of marshes and swamps. And the swamps actually have more trees than the marshes do. Marshes have more grasses. 
sometimes marshes are not actually lakes they're very slow moving rivers like for example in florida we have a big big marsh that's uh, basically the saw, uh, sawgrass and the sawgrass uh, everglades is actually a very slow flowing river not really a lake but um, a very important ecosystem either way so lakes are mostly without vegetation in them maybe inside of them yes but not over the surface bogs a lot of vegetation less vegetation you're going to have either marshes or uh, swamps and the biggest difference is going to be where you are basically in tropical e ecosystems where there's a lot of rain you're going to tend to be more swampy and temperate ecosystems where there's less rain it's going to be a little more um, grassy like the the marshes and of course you also have those tiny little ponds you have to count the ponds right most of them are artificial but there's some natural ones out there now the interesting thing about lakes ecosystems is that they go through cycles and it's actually very uh, important to learn about this now throughout the months of the year for example especially along lakes that actually freeze you're gonna have this turnover cycle that's very important like during the winter when the top of the water freezes you're gonna actually create a gradient where the top of the water is very cold right but then under that, the temperature is actually pretty comfortable. It's a 4 degrees Celsius. Now, this, uh, that's actually really cold, but it's not as cold as it is up here, where the temperature could be as down as negative 20 degrees Celsius. But that's the cool thing about that ice. That ice that's on the surface of the water actually insulates the rest of the lake. But the interesting thing is that throughout the winter months, the water circulation pretty much stops in the winter in the lake. And so uh, the nutrients will stop flowing around. And the, the lake goes into a semi-hibernation period where the life forms kind of have to like uh, sleep almost, you know, lower their metabolism to survive the winter. But then the spring comes in and the ice melts and then the convection returns where the top of the water is going to be hotter than the bottom of the water, which is going to be colder. And that's going to cause the water to constantly flow around as well. And so and the wind is going to be blowing in the surface and that's going to circulate things in the lake and this actually going to pick up nutrients from the bottom of the water and spread them around and the producers will go back to life and a lot of uh, productivity is going to return to the lake by the time it gets to summer it will be at the maximum of its productivity and now the lake also again stops circulating because you're going to have instead what we call a thermocline uh, that the temperature is going to be hotter in the surface and as you go deeper it gets colder and colder all right, notice in the spring, the temperature was pretty much constant throughout the lake, but during the summer, the temperature is actually going down as, as you uh, go in deeper into the lake. Then towards the autumn, you return to the, to the, to the constant temperature state, and again, the nutrients start to cir circle around, but then the productivity is already going down, and you're going heading towards the winter time. Now, that's also interesting that a lot the lakes, well, life in the lakes is going to depend a lot on what's around the lake and how much is running into the lake because remember erosion is constantly being going to be dragging things into these lakes and so in in here in times where there's a lot of rain all those nutrients from the land are going to jump into the lake so whatever is the the, the part of the ear that's raining a lot it's going to bring a lot of the nutrients into the into the thing now that's also important about the life of lakes because lakes go to go through stages and you see some of these stages represented over here that in the beginning the lakes uh, barely have any nutrients so the water is very clear there's very little life living in it because of the lack of nutrients there's not a lot of algae or plants living in the water and the water is typically very clear so this you see this this stage here and we call that an oligotrophic lake oligotrophic lake that means there's not food yet for everybody all right so it's a young lake now as the run, more and more runoff gathers on top of the lake and we'll talk more about this when we do population ecology and another lecture series but as nutrients dump into the lake it starts gathering more and more nutrients and heading towards the other end of the spectrum where the lake is so full of nutrients that it's covered with vegetation lots of algae darker water uh, the, the the ground if you look at here on the top what I'm going to be drawing it's actually starts becoming full of you know nutrients in the bottom so the lake actually becomes shallower because a bunch of dead stuff detritus it's what it's called it's going to start gathering up at the bottom here uh, and algae is going to start gathering up on the top and other plants and things like that and eventually this is going to become the cover is going to become so thick with vegetation that no sunlight can penetrate that anymore so that all the sunlight that used to go down to the bed of the lake will stop at the surface of the water because of that green uh, cover that it has, which will kill anything that's below here the lake. And also, 
the oxygen level is going to be drop under here. There's going to be very, very little oxygen down here because the majority of the production is at the surface and the producers themselves are consuming all the oxygen that they're making. This last stage is the death of the lake because at this point the lake will not be able to maintain its uh, life for very much longer. And the name for that is eutrophication. Eutrophication. So that's when the you get to the final end of the of the life of the lake, and you have a true eutrophic lake. At which point, uh, it's pretty much going to be called a dead lake unless more water gets added to that, or the nutrients are somehow removed off the lake. Another set of biomes that's very interesting is going to be in between the salt water and the fresh water, and this is going to happen when in the environment the uh, sea sometimes during the high tide invades the land where a river is, is hitting it. That area in between where the river and the fresh water and the salt water of the ocean mix in is called an estuary. You see other examples over here. Now all of these are estuaries. Now they may look like uh, lakes sometimes but they're not actually. Their water is moving very slowly and during the day the tide will come in and come out of this so that sometimes the, the, the salinity will vary a lot in these places but and there will be a lot of specialized plants and we talked about the junkers for example which will help maintain the salinity of the water a little bit down and it will help slow down the water so the nutrients don't kind of like just run away but these are very very rich ecosystems on the earth now there's two main types of estuaries uh, in tropical areas where there's a lot of sunlight and a lot of nutrients uh, they get to grow trees and mangroves these kinds of trees over here with big roots and very specialized roots to handle the salty situation actually dominate the, these kinds of estuaries and then those kinds of estuaries or those kinds of estuaries are called marshes salt marshes and they're basically uh, more grassland like and are more common in temperate areas where there's less nutrients and less amount of sunlight and temperature as well but these are both estuaries which are aquatic ecosystems where there's a, a mixture of, of salt water and the plants and animals living in that environment have to be able to adapt to that and later in the year we might talk about some of the adaptations that are peculiar to organisms that live in these kinds of environments